So I, I just want to say, uh, C.S. Lewis had this concept. He talked about how the figure of Jesus, uh, Aslan, is good, but he's not tame. And that's our experience of the spirit. He's good, but he's not tame. He just might disrupt your life. He just might do something in you that you weren't looking for. You know, like the fire experience that I described to you, I was not looking for that or asking for that. In fact, none of the, pretty much none of what's happened was I looking for. I never really wanted to be the guy who was on stage talking about healing. I thought, I'm not cool enough. I don't have poofy hair. I'm not dramatic enough to do that. I never wanted to do that. But God just grabbed me and it happened. You know, he, he takes us and takes us places we did not choose. And in that sense, he's not tame. Sometimes when he comes, he releases his power us in ways that seem almost violent. And if you're looking on, you can be afraid or put off by that. But the person that it's happening to is always actually quite happy with what's happening because they're on the inside. And so like if you're looking on at somebody and it seems like, you know, what's that? You know, is that all right? Just go talk to them afterwards. Like go ask them what was happening. That's what I did. I just, I've just, you know, I've prayed for like 20, 30,000 people and I just, I just get people's faces and ask them, What's going on? Why are you doing that? Is it good? <laughs> I ask him those kind of questions. You can do that. But just remember, he's not tame. You know, and in that sense, he's not safe. Because he has his own agenda. He's not necessarily going to take you on your agenda. He might take you in places you did not plan to go. Ask you to do things you did not plan to do. That's the nature of it. Okay, we just finished talking about the treasure of the kingdom. And now I'd like to talk to you about the hardships of entering the kingdom. Acts chapter 14, verse 21. Paul and Barnabas are finishing up their first missionary journey. And as they finish up, they start going back and revisiting the churches that they've established. So we'll pick this up at uh, verse 21. They preached the gospel in that city and won a large number of disciples. And then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Now that's interesting. Their message is you must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom, and that's encouraging. It's encouraging when you know it's coming and when you know why. It's happening. But you cannot enter into the kingdom. You cannot live this kingdom life apart from hardship. You cannot see all that you pray for apart from hardship. You cannot see miracles. You cannot see justice. You cannot see any of the, the manifestations of the kingdom of God without there being hardship and without going through hardship. And I want to explain to you why and how hardship is a part of entering into the kingdom. Now here's the first thing you have to understand. The kingdom we want to see, the kingdom we pray for, when we pray the Lord's Supper, prayer, you know, may your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as in heaven. That kingdom, when we 
are seeking that and praying for that, you have to understand that kingdom is not at peace. That kingdom is in war. That kingdom is in war. It's a kingdom in a state of war. So when you pray for the kingdom, you're signing up for the army. And there's going to be, it's going to be a war, folks. I don't know what you thought you were getting into when you said yes to Jesus. But I'm here to tell you, you're in the army now. And you can't get out. There's no way to become a civilian. Short of being dead. There's no other way. You're in the army now. And, you know, so we have verses like Ephesians 6, 10, where he says, Finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Not flesh and blood. But against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in these heavenly realms, that is the spiritual realm. The kingdom of God is invading this world to take it back for God from the kingdom of darkness that is the ruler of this world. That means war. And every time we take a step towards God, every time we take a step towards the kingdom, every time we stretch out our hand, the enemy wants to stop us or pull us back. He wants to take that territory back. Anytime somebody's, you know, they're in alpha, they're starting to actually really seriously consider following Jesus. You know what's going to happen? A whole bunch of stuff is going to get thrown at them to make them wonder, well, maybe I shouldn't follow Jesus. Because the kingdom of darkness is going to rise up and try to bring confusion to that situation and keep them from making that decision. In war, there are casualties. In war, there are traitors. In war, there are cowards, deserters. In war, there's confusion. In war, some people seem to be more competent than others. In war, there are victories. In war, there are defeats. In this kingdom, we experience all of it. We experience leaders who fail. We experience people we've invested in and trusted abandon us or betray us. Well, what did you think it was going to be? What did you think it was going to be like? You know, in war, if the guy next to me gets shot and he's down, do I say, that's it, I'm done, I can't take it anymore, and go home? No, that's not what you do. You don't quit because it turned out it's a war. You double down. You say, no, I'm going to make the devil pay for what he did to my friend. You're going to take my friend down? I'm going to lead 50 more people to Jesus. Make him pay. I, you know, my, my, every time it happens, my response is, give me some way to kick the devil in the teeth. And the Holy Spirit is more than happy to provide opportunities. Because it's a war. Now look, half of the people that I started with didn't make it. Half. It's not, it's messy. 
And it's hard. I've lost friends. I've had all kinds of misunderstanding. Had people who would, don't talk to me anymore. Is that going to stop me? No, it's not. Because I understood up front, we're in a war. I'm going to fight. I'm not going to give up. If I give up, then the devil's got what he wants. Then, then he's won, and he's really won. Just, no, we're going to keep fighting. There are going, there are going to be churches... They're going to be leaders that would disappoint us. And it's hard. But in a certain sense, so what? Yeah, so what? Like, God, God will bring them under judgment. He'll expose them. It'll all be resolved. But we got to press on. We got a job to do. We've got a war to fight. We got to press on. We can't stop because of them. We don't leave the church because of that. I don't know what you thought you were getting into when you got into the church. You know, just in case you didn't know it, it's not a gathering of angels. You know, when I was young, I had these all these ideals, of course, about what the church was going to be, and how it should be, and how none of the churches are like the way it should be. And I went with one of my friends on school break to his home, and his parents took it to, to this prayer meeting. It was, you know, in those days, everybody had prayer meetings all the time. Um, and uh, we go to this prayer meeting, and there's like, I don't know, 100 people crowded into this guy's house for a prayer meeting. And so we go through the whole thing, and then my friend takes me up to meet the guy that's leading it, and we, you know, did some kind of introductions and I don't remember saying anything to him and he turns to me and he looks at me and he says you know what your problem is he says your problem is you're looking for the perfect church and the problem is if you ever did find one you'd probably join it and ruin it the best rebuke I ever got Because he's like helping me understand, like, of course it's going to be imperfect. Of course, like, you know, people leave the church because somebody, they got hurt by somebody in the church. I'm thinking, you got hurt by somebody in the church? Well, what a surprise. Like, I could give you a list, a long list of all the people I got hurt by. Right? Because why? Why? They're people. Haven't you been hurt by people in your family? Brothers, sisters, mothers and dads? Do we leave our families because of it? Not usually. Not unless it's really bad. You know, we have to be realistic about the fact it's a war. We are in a war. You also have to be prepared in this war. We have weapons that are more than sufficient to overcome all the power of evil in this war. We have weapons available. They're more than sufficient, but only if you use them. If you don't use your weapons, you're a sitting duck. You know, in the early days with Wimber, we'd come on these conferences and, and you know we'd see signs and wonders miracles in front of our faces but every time there'd be somebody on the team that would be attacked by the evil one in their minds he likes to attack us in our thinking and he'd put all this negative thinking in their minds stuff like nobody gets healed when you pray for them God's not really in you God hasn't really forgiven you for whatever, fill in the blank. In fact, nobody on this team actually likes you. You never should have come. And the next thing you know, they're like hiding off in the, they're in the hallway or they're in the corner. And we're having visible miracles in here and they're missing out on it because they've got this thing in their head 
telling them that they're disqualified, that they're not a part of it, that they're separate. Uh, it's, it's all demon talk. So we finally got to where we tell, we'd tell them, we know that somebody's going to be attacked this way. To go on this trip, you have to make a commitment that if that happens to you, you will tell somebody. That's all. Just tell somebody. And then they would tell somebody. They'd pass the word around real quick. We'd get three people on them. We'd pray against that negative thinking for about three minutes, pop that thing like popping a soap bubble, and they'd get back to work. Okay? Our weapons are more than sufficient if we use them. The thing is, a bunch of you are getting beat up by the devil. He's feeding you lies. About yourself, about God, about your friends, about the, about the church. And you're getting beat up and you're not telling anybody and you're not using your weapons and you're wondering why it feels so bad. Because you're not fighting with your weapons. Right? Get some people praying for you. We got to pray. I was so glad we prayed in the middle today. It's so important. And even better, get people to pray before you get attacked. You know, if you're thinking of starting a church, you need... 14 people to commit to pray for you, two per day for every day of the week to fast and pray for you starting tomorrow. Because when you say, I'm agreeing to start a church, the devil hears it and he's gonna be on your case and he will attack your mind, he'll attack your body, he'll attack your wife, he'll attack your kids, he'll attack your house, he'll attack your car, anything he can get through to you with to try to discourage you and make you give up and you need a wall of protection. Which is easy to do, all you need is 14 people who will pray for you for a few minutes every day. The weapons are more than sufficient if you use them. But we're getting hurt because we're not using it. Because we aren't being realistic about the fact that we're in a war. And I'm telling you, we're in a war. This is not going to come easy, folks. It's going to be messy the whole way. And you got to be ready to fight. Second, to enter the ministry of the kingdom, we must first come to the end of ourselves. When I went through that time of failure in planning the church in the inner city and the three and a half years of depression, I came to the end of myself. Out of that grew everything else. Because from that time forward, I stopped trying to make things happen myself. I came to the end of myself. John Wimber tells the story about how the Lord met him and he said, well, I've seen your ministry and it's kind of so-so, but let me show you my ministry because we've got to let go of our ministry if we want to find his ministry because his ministry is where all the goodies are where all the treasures are, where all the power is. You want to see power? You want to see people healed? You want to see people's lives changed? You want to see a move of God? Well, then you're going to have to come to the end of yourself. We have to let go of performance and striving and thinking we're going to think our way into this or work our way into this. It's not going to work. I'll tell you, there's only one thing that works, and that's hear and obey. Just hear and obey. If you read the story of the great men and women of history that God used powerfully in kingdom ministry, you will find in almost every story some place where they came to the end of themselves. You can't pick it out. You can't do it for yourself. God, I will come to the end of myself. It doesn't work that easy. 
No, he has to custom design it just for you. And he will be faithful to bring it to you if you are praying for the kingdom. So when you say, may your kingdom come, may your will be done in my life, you are asking for trouble. Most of you are young. Most of you haven't come to this yet. But I'm telling you, it's assigned. It's already been picked. The plan is already in place for when God's going to bring you to the end of yourself. When it comes, don't be surprised. At least try to remember. Steve told us it was going to be like this. Because then if you can rely on him, great things will happen. Great things will happen. God's power is perfected in weakness. Number three, Jesus told us that the kingdom of God is always going to have, in this age, mixed results. I won't take the time to read the story, but it's very familiar to most of you. He tells the story, he says, the kingdom of God is like this. Whenever Jesus says the kingdom of God is like this, pay attention, he's telling you something about how this life is going to go. He's not talking about the distant future when Jesus comes back. He's talking about here and now. He says, the kingdom of God is like this. The sower goes out to sow the seed. The seed of the gospel. And some of it falls on good soil. And they receive it with joy and they grow up and they bear fruit, you know, a hundredfold. But some of it falls on three other kinds of soil and they're pretty disappointing results. So the, the net effect is in effect, what Jesus is saying is 25% of the people you try to invest in are going to come through and the other 75% not so much. But the problem is you don't know which is which. Up front, they all look alike. One of the challenges in my life has been that I've, I've made it my life's business to invest in raising up leaders because I'm thoroughly, thoroughly convinced that, you know, uh, the biggest constriction, the biggest holdup for us is the development of leaders. So I want to do everything I can to develop leaders and... I've, you know, done, I've taught classes and had mentoring meetings and prayed and took people with me and everything I can think of to raise up and train leaders. And I've, we've probably, well, we, we've planted out from our church 25 churches. We've, we've raised up and sent as staff pastors to other churches something like 150 pastors from our church. But you know what? We trained a lot more than that. We invested in a lot more than that, and they didn't all turn out. Some of the ones that seemed like, oh, surely they'll be the ones that really stand out. They're going to do great things for God. Uh, fell by the wayside, did something else, went some other direction, you know, it didn't happen. Some other people that we hardly noticed. There was this guy who we had, we had like, I don't know, at one point, like maybe 30 seminarians in our church. So they're all wanting to go into ministry. And we're investing in all of them as best we can. And uh, one of them never said a word. Never said anything. Always sat in the corner. Never spoke up. Never asked for anything. Never put himself forward. Didn't know quite what was going on with him or what he was doing. Then one day he comes and says, I think God's calling me to Ireland. Long story short, we sent him off to Belfast to do an internship. And he ended up leading that church. His name's Andy Smith. And he became the best leader of the entire bunch. You guys owe us. 
okay? Nobody would have predicted it. So, you know, it could be the, that person that doesn't talk, the quiet person in the corner might be the one that actually makes you look the best. You don't know. You know, I've talked to Jay Pathic about this, you know, we, it, and he just basically, we both concluded, it's all just a big trip to Las Vegas. You don't know how it's going to turn out. <laughs> like, we've tried really hard to, like, study people's character and, you know, try to figure out, you know, if you invest in this person, you'll surely get a return. No. Jesus said the kingdom of God's going to be like this. And what do we do? The only thing you can do is just keep sowing seed. And if three of them out of the four flake out, you just go plant some more seed. And you keep planting more seed. And you keep planting more seed. And you don't let the fact that some of them disappointed you make you stop. Because Jesus told you up front, it's, it's, it's going to be like this. And if you just keep planting more seed, you'll get more victories as well as more defeats. But that's part of the hardship. You have to be able to press on when it's not always as successful as you would like. You know, one of the things John Wimmer used to tell us is he says, look, remember, you're not people keepers. Okay, understand, you're going to invest in people and then they're going to go. You're not people keepers, you're people processors. And you just try to send them on to the next place in better shape than they came. <laughs> yeah, so you have, to, you have to embrace that. That is a hardship in some ways because we would like to win every time. We would like to keep people with us all the time because you get close to people. You can't invest in them without getting close to them. And when, they're, when it doesn't turn out, you're disappointed. You will be disappointed. You'll feel the disappointment. It hurts. But you have to just turn right around and say, who is God bringing next? And do it again. And keep doing it again. And then finally, number four, It's hard to enter the kingdom because to achieve the fullness of kingdom ministry, we must go through the wilderness. Matthew chapter three, verse 16. Jesus goes to the river Jordan to be baptized by John. And it says, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water and at that moment, heaven was opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. I mean, this, it doesn't get much better than that. It's sort of like the heavens are opened. A voice from heaven. The Spirit of God in bodily form. And then it says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And in the wilderness, the only voice he heard was the voice of the devil. And the question was, would he be faithful to the word he already knew? Would he be faithful to the word of God in the scriptures and the word of God he heard at the River Jordan. All the temptations are centered around, are you really the son of God? Does God really love you? The devil is trying to get him to doubt in the wilderness what happened at the River Jordan. Let me tell you something. If God meets you and he touches you in power and he calls you, He's done something miraculous in your life. Never doubt in the darkness then what you've seen in the light. You hang on to it. And then what comes next, it says, in Luke 4, 14, Jesus returned to Galilee. This is after the wilderness in the power of the Spirit. 
Those who ask God for more, those who say, I want everything that you have for me, those who want to see more of the kingdom will follow Jesus through the wilderness. And in the wilderness, you will be tested for your faithfulness to what you've heard from God and what you know from God when the only voice you can hear is the voice of the devil. About 12 years ago, I had an experience where suddenly one day I felt as if I had fallen over a cliff. And when I hit the bottom, there was silence. I couldn't hear God at all. Now you have to understand that before this, it's been like my life is filled with the voice of God. I'm hearing God all the time. I hear God every day. I, it's, it's like I'm hearing the voice of God constantly. It went completely silent in a day. And for three years, I heard nothing. Complete silence for three years. I was in my 60s. Nothing. Nothing. I had to operate entirely by what I already knew from the word, from what God had taught me. I continued to lead my church. I continued to minister to other people. I couldn't get any words for people, but I could still see how the spirit was moving on them by watching a vineyard secret. You can open your eyes and see what God is doing. Other groups don't seem to get it. It's our special secret. Okay, so I used that. I could, I could still do ministry on that basis, but I got no words. Heard nothing. But when it lifted, after about three years, it started to lift. I found that I had new spiritual gift that I didn't have before. A powerful gift that I didn't have before. Things were happening with me. At first, I didn't even know what it was. It's just like something different's happened. Something's happened to me. There's something more powerful happening in me, and I don't even know what to call it. You know, I had some conversations with some other people that maybe were a little further down the road. You know, like, what is this? Um, all of which is to say this. If you want more, there, you, there'll be wilderness. There might be one, there might be two in your life. You'll go through wilderness. You have to be faithful. If you come out on the other side, there will be more power. But you have to be faithful. It doesn't matter how old you are. You know, I think it's, it's significant. I'm in my 60s and I got a new spiritual gift I didn't have before. So all of you people here who are in your 50s, 60s, or 70s, I can't see in your faces because you're all hiding in the back. But, but uh, God's not done with you yet. <laughs> God's not done with you yet, and he might still have some surprises for you. But you might still have some surprises for you, but... It might be on the other side of wilderness. And the key is, don't run when you get in the wilderness. Don't run, don't give up. Like, I understood, I understood exactly what was happening. I knew it was wilderness. I knew it was a test. I didn't know how long it would last. But I knew there was nothing I could do but go through it. And I knew I would be tested as long as he felt that he needed to test me. And that the only choice was to be faithful. And so I did it. That's what I did. But that is sort of the last part of the hardship of entering the kingdom. Why is this encouraging? Because I think that if we knew what was going on, if we were prepared for the hardships, they wouldn't be so dangerous to us. 
there's so many that have given up because um, they weren't prepared for the hardship. There's a young pastor in the States uh, who planted a church and, you know, Sandy and I coached hundreds of church planters. And one of the things that we tell church planters is that there's a certain point in the life of your church where the enemy will send an overwhelming deception on one of the people who is most close to you. Usually it's your best friend that you went on vacation with. He'll send them an overwhelming deception and they'll begin to speak the words of the enemy against your call and against your character. They'll say, you know, they'll begin to oppose you to other people. They'll try to gather people to their side. They'll try to destroy your ministry. Your best friends. And it's not your best friends, actually, that are speaking. It's the enemy speaking through them. And that happened to him. Best friends, they'd been on vacation together. They'd done everything together. All of a sudden, they turned against him, and they questioned his character. It wasn't questioning a decision. That would just be normal criticism. That's what my wife does. It wouldn't, not, I'm, that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about somebody questioning a decision. It's somebody questioning your motives, questioning your call, questioning whether you're, you should even be doing this. That's why you know it's from the evil one. Because what he wants to do is strike the shepherd, then scatter the sheep and pick them off one by one. So this happened to him and he said, I didn't sign up for this. Like, this hurts a really lot. I didn't sign up for this. I'm quitting. But his wife said, I'm not quitting. So she took over the church and kept going. And he, he went back to business, he thought. So he's doing his business. But over the space of six months, he ran into something like 20, 30, 40 waitresses, maids, Uber drivers, other people who would turn to him and say, you're a pastor, aren't you? And you're running away from God, aren't you? Like God had his prophetic people out there ready to get him. And they just chased him down. And finally, he realized, I'm still called, and I can't get away, and he went back. And they, they let it go. They realized, we can't let broken, hurting people who've been overwhelmed by the enemy stop us from what God is doing. And the church is better than it's ever been. And God's prospering them. People are coming to Jesus. And he says, I'm having more fun than ever. It's better than ever. But he had to get over that. And it almost took him out because he wasn't prepared for it. He didn't realize, oh, like, the, we're gonna, this is part of the process. Like, we're in this war and the enemy's gonna try to take us out. They didn't realize that. It almost did. So, as you look ahead, some of you, you look ahead and you see the casualties. And you think, well, why would I wanna sign up for that? And I'm telling you, well, a lot of the casualties are casualties because they didn't pick up their weapons. They weren't prepared. They didn't understand what they were getting into. But I'm telling you what you're getting into. So now you can't, you can't say, I don't understand, because I told you just now. Like, you can't get off the hook. Like, you can do this and not crash and burn. You can do this and not get burned out but you have to use your weapons.